Okay, uh, I'm Wayne McCain. Uh, very happy to be here today. Would like to talk with you about some research that's ongoing at Athens State University and also cooperation with Florida Institute of Technology and the Dive Right Company. Uh, First of all, uh, we'd like to just briefly remind everybody of what it requires to stay alive in space. First of all, typically you need a pressure vessel around the astronaut, some protection from extreme environmental hazards like radiation, micrometeorites, etc. The human performance, uh, we're b basically talking here in this paper about a spacesuit and the life support system associated with it. So performance of that suit and the associated uh, accessories are very important to success. And of course, thermal control. Uh, the backpack or portable life support system part of the space suit and the associated accessories, so to speak, include an oxygen supply, some kind of control for pressure, carbon dioxide and trace contaminant removal, uh, humidity control, uh, including uh, thermal control, also power communications and data display. So the major functions then of a portable life support system, which we'll abbreviate PLSS, is the atmosphere control, temperature and humidity control, water and food management. There's actually some provisions made in some of the spacesuits, if not all of them, to give an astronaut uh, access to uh, water for control of dehydration. Also, microbial control to uh, uh, reduce pathogens and so forth that might enter the system. Collection and storage of human waste and, of course, astronaut safety. Radiation shielding, also various types of fault detection, warnings, and that sort of thing. Okay, some engineering design constraints would include weight and volume. We all know, of course, that uh, those are premiums when it comes to space travel. Needs to be simple and straightforward. Uh, training uh, needs would be to, a goal would be to reduce those, not make it too complicated to operate. Minimize the power and data needs. A long shelf life and to be bulletproof technology, pretty much fail-safe type of technology. It would need to support identified standards of performance and meet uh, risk management analyses, in other words, some predetermined risk criteria. It needs to be modular. When we go to Mars, we're not going to be able to send it back on a warranty repair if it uh, goes down, right? It need to be line replaceable. Zero G in Mars orbit or low Earth orbit and also partial G is in on the surface of Mars and radiation hardened. Uh, also needs to be insensitive to temperature gradients and here we're talking as much about the um, electronics as anything. Here are some of the spacesuits that you all are accustomed to seeing probably. The one on the far left is the Apollo suit followed by the uh, International Space Station suit, similar to what was used also on shuttle. And NASA has a series of new suits called the Z suits. I think they're up to like Z3 now. One of the neat provisions about these are that they're integrated into a Mars rover design such they would be easy to access, don and doff the suit itself. And also these are designed to offer some increased mobility and uh, lightweight and so forth. Uh, Georgia Tech did a study not long ago though that looked at some of the current suits, past suits, and the more advanced suits and as you can see by this chart what they determined was that the MIT bio suit design seemed to meet best the uh, criteria that they were graded against which included the weight or mass the donning time, the uh, suit donning volume, uh, what kind of assistance might be needed in putting the suit on and taking it off. And of big importance, major importance, is the mobility. 
and the sensitivity to dust. A lot of small dust particles on Mars, of course. So in that study, the bio suit came out overall rated tops. So for our study, which is mainly to look at designing a PLSS around some existing rebreather technologies, we have assumed that we would use biosuit technology. And I'll get into the reasons why that makes sense to us. This is the biosuit. I'm sure you've seen a lot about it. It's been very well um, advertised and discussed lately. Uh, Dr. Deva Newman at MIT has been leading that research for some time. Really goes back into the early 1970s when uh, Mr. Paul Webb investigated this concept, but due to a lack of materials, advanced materials availability, it was not funded uh, past some initial studies. However, with what we have available these days, the concept of designing a suit based on lines of non-extension, that is to say that there are portions on the human body of tissue that do not extend when we move and work. So if you use those as basically hard points, you can incorporate what MIT refers to and earlier researchers did too, mechanical counterpressure to provide the pressure that's needed to maintain the integrity of body tissue without pressurizing the whole torso. So that allows us to basically pneumatically pressurize only the helmet. So we're putting an atmosphere in the helmet and not the entire suit. Here is Dr. Newman in the suit. And uh, you see the advanced uh, EMU suit from ISS on the left here. 300 pounds on Earth. Uh, it is working at an internal pressure of 4.3 PSI and is considered the world's smallest spacecraft, right? It's a self-contained spacecraft. Uh, Dr. Newman also reports that they, there are studies out there that indicate that an astronaut's energy expense, 75% uh, of the energy expended by an astronaut is allotted to just moving the suit. That's not doing any work. That's just moving the suit. It's not a locomotion suit. You know, it's designed really to float around in space, not to uh, do activities on the surface of a planet. This is a rendition of the bio suit on the right there that shows that it's, it's designed to be lightweight, highly mobile, and uh, allow that only the uh, helmet can be pressurized. Well, in comes the concept of using some existing rebreather technology for application on a Mars portable life support system. What you see here is uh, a picture of the CEO of the dive right company, Mr. Lamar Hires, uh, which the company dates back to 1984 and is currently producing and marketing and selling what they refer to as the Optima, O2 Optima really, I guess, a rebreather a very state-of-the-art, lightweight, uh, it weighs like uh, 54 pounds out of the water, I think, something like that loaded. Uh, on Mars, that would weigh like 20 pounds if you just use the suit, as, uh, the system as is. Uh, so the technology is very reliable. Divers that go to 400 feet or more in a cold, dark cave, in my estimate, probably are in about as much risk as an astronaut on Mars would be. So it's very reliable, uh, redundant electronics, uh, bailout system, which we're looking at as well in case you had a failure. So we're looking at taking that technology, putting it on Mars. It uses the, uh, the commonly understood uh, hydroxide technology. Lithium hydroxide is used in submarines and CO2 scrubbers in the Optima calcium hydroxide is used because there's really an adverse reaction between seawater and lithium hydroxide, as you can imagine. It, it forms what's called a caustic cocktail, which you don't want to happen if you're diving. And it uh, happens rarely, I think, but when it happens, 
it's not a good thing. So calcium hydroxide uh, is an improvement over that situation. So that's used in the Optima. Uh, so it's a new, new generation, really, using the most up-to-date electronics and very cost-effective. As you all know, that uh, typical uh, spacesuits that we use these days outfitted are like two or three million dollars a copy. Uh, I think Dive Right would cut you a really good deal, a little bit less than that price range. But seriously, we're, we're going to show you how it could really work. Uh, so uh, the Optima is a fully closed circuit, electronically controlled rebreather. It uses a quick replace scrubber cartridge, which is important. Very uh, reliable electronic control. Works on a constant partial pressure of oxygen design. And we think it may really offer a new approach to portable life support systems. Here's what it looks like. You may have seen one out on the floor. We have one on display today, fully operational unit. As I said, weighs about uh, 54 pounds fully loaded, 29 pounds without the tanks. It uh, uses an oxygen tank and a combination of oxygen, nitrogen, like a dilute air tank for uh, adding air to the uh, closed loop system if needed. But uh, that's kind of what it looks like. And I'm going to explain some more of the features as we go along here, maybe. OK, the primary features. It also, and these are, a lot of these are only related to diving, of course. But it uses over the sho shoulder counter lungs, which help uh, minimize the effort put forth by a diver to breathe. Uh, this diving unit is powered by the lungs of the diver, basically. So you want to reduce the, uh, the necessary effort to breathe. The counter lungs do that. Started out with a Jurgensen Marine Hammerhead uh, Electronics. I think we're using another brand nowadays. Uh, what is that? Shearwater. Shearwater is the uh, controller. Uh, so it has two different types of heads-up displays that we'll talk about. Uh, has integrated alarms and so forth, uh, redundant oxygen sensors, uh, a lot of choices on harnesses and so forth. So for the diver, it's really a very uh, well thought out and uh, designed system. This is the breathing loop. If you look at it here, the um, the, the good air comes in on the green side here. Uh, the uh, exhale air basically is exhaled, goes through a, the scrubber cartridge, comes around through the sensor or electronics head, and uh, is analyzed, uh, goes into one of the uh, counter lungs that I described, and then to a demand valve, which is equivalent to the last stage in a typical scuba diving regulator. Uh, it has one-way valve so that when you breathe in, the good air comes in. When you breathe out, it can only go toward the scrubber. So pretty simple circuit there. Here's the heart of the Optima. It is a proprietary process micro-pore incorporated extend air cartridge. They have a process now that replaces, it used to be common to just use granules of either lithium hydroxide or whatever. And it was very inefficient, inconsistent in loading the uh, scrubbers and lots of other reasons. So micro-pore has come up with this uh, process of basically integrating the constituents of the absorbent into a plastic sheet with uh, spacing uh, rails that allow you to roll it up and it gives a uniform distance between the sheets and allows you to much uh, better utilize the uh, cartridges, get more of the life out of them. Uh, very good idea. This is the content. It uh, Basically has 85% absorbent, 3% sodium hydroxide, some potassium hydroxide, and the polyethylene is basically the plastic binder that's used to uh, hold it all together. So, 
This is the cartridge. It looks, uh, we have some out there that you can look at, but they're about the half the size of a paper towel roll, basically. A little bit on the heavy side, but uh, easy to insert and uh, have a, depending on the conditions, and this is very condition and diver dependent, have a duration up to about 12 hours, I guess, depending on the scenario of the dive in question here. Okay, so how do we take those features of the Optima and turn that into a portable life support system for Mars. Well, we're going we're gonna to use a 100% oxygen system because we can run at 4.3 PSI and on Mars, which has a practically a vacuum environment, that is well within the guidelines of uh, low toxicity for 100% oxygen. So we can operate 12 hours without a problem. We're also going to uh, incorporate temperature, humidity regulation. 12 hours of total operational time, that would be an 8-hour standard EVA and 4-hour emergency reserve in case, you know, you get your foot caught in a rock or get lost or whatever happens. So you got some time there. There's also another feature that we're going to talk about here later. Uh, provide the cooling water and power to the suit. What you saw on the bio suit is basically the skin tight layer. There's more to it than that. There would be a, a layer that would be like uh, an undergarment with the water circulating tubes or at least uh, a coolant and heater to keep the body temperature regulated. We also need to remove moisture from in the body uh, cavities. So there's uh, things to do there. But it's our concept that we would move most of the data, communications, hardware to the helmet. Uh, it turns out that electronics, as you know, you can put a Sony TV on a postage stamp these days. So you can very easily put a fairly high power transceiver or two or three in a helmet and hardly know it's there. Also a battery system, a backup uh, autonomous battery would be in the helmet. So basically, you'd charge your backpack and your helmet separately. They're autonomous. And we're thinking of this uh, bailout system, similar to what divers use. One of the things that makes it uh, reliable for divers is, in case there is a, a, an equipment failure, they have a bailout system. They can stop using the rebreather and go to a small regulator and, and tank and all and get to safety. Uh, we would propose, and of course we haven't designed that part yet, but some TBD amount of autonomous, completely uh, separated from the PLSS in the helmet. It would be a small uh, oxygen reservoir and uh, electronics and so forth. So it might be, what, 10, 15 minutes? We don't know what it would be. But it might give you time to get someplace and safety in case you had a total failure or a boulder fell on your backpack or something like that. And we're foreseeing that maybe the helmets could be interchangeable based on head size, just like you might get a motorcycle helmet or something. But the suits, as you probably already know, have to be custom made for every individual. The body is laser scanned. That scan is used to generate a pattern to create the suit. So it's a very tight, skin tight fit to make that work properly. Here's the basic respiration chemical reaction at the cellular level. And so what we're looking at is for burning one molecule of sugar, we need six molecules of oxygen, six molecules of water. We get out of that six molecules of CO2, which of course we don't need, and then 12 molecules of water. So there's a lot of humidity that we've got to be concerned with, along with the CO2. So as I said, we're looking at uh, 4.3 PSI, 100% oxygen atmosphere, which removes one of those tanks and lightens the backpack weight. Keep the carbon dioxide below toxic level and also remove trace gases. As you know, the body generates other gases when metabolism takes place. And this is just sort of a rule of thumb. For about every kilogram of oxygen that's respirated, 
the body generates about 1.2 kilograms of CO2, and that's introduced into the breathing loop. So that's what the, uh, of course, the scrubber takes out. And for our study, we're looking at using some data from the Fundamentals of Space Medicine Handbook, as well as the SMAD, the uh, Space Mission Analysis and Design Handbook that everybody uses. But uh, basically, uh, an astronaut at average activity would use about 0.035 kilograms of oxygen per hour uh, at 12 hours, and by doubling that rate based on assumed activity, we get about a kilogram, 0.84 kilograms of oxygen would output about one kilogram of uh, CO2 during that time frame. So that puts us in a ballpark. Here's our notional uh, block diagram of the, the unit, what it what needs to do. Of course, again, I said we're working with the helmet as the only pressurized vessel of the system. We would have a charcoal, activated charcoal canister to remove impurities. We would have our electronically controlled redundant valves to uh, supply the oxygen to the loop. The CO2 scrubber that we talked about. And by the way, this is a continuous flow system, so you wouldn't have the same sort of uh, Darth Vader uh, demand sort of thing going on that you would have in the uh, rebreather for diving. So it would be continuous flow, although we foresee uh, incorporating the ability to increase that flow rate based on demand. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, and then redundant battery packs, redundant CPUs, all those kinds of things to make it work. Here's a picture of it. As part of what we're going to do, we're going to design the helmet, of course, so it's because it's so closely integrated with the backpack. Here's the scrubber. You'd have a single oxygen tank, uh, the charcoal canister, the temperature humidity control. What's not shown here are all the uh, interconnects and battery packs and so forth. And um, those have been eliminated from this picture for uh, clarity. Where do we go from here? Well, this is like a three-month study. This was done with a group of students and myself uh, uh, from FIT and from also Athens State with the help of Dive Right. But we're looking at trying to move forward with the preliminary design process and start some critical technology tests. There's some things we need to, to test and then build a functional prototype and do some basic testing. And we hope to get that done and have some results to report at next year's conference. And hopefully we can have the functional prototype here. So there's any number of ways to skin a cat and we're looking at some of the ways we might do that. We, considering options. So the so conclusions are that uh, this is a very uh, straightforward uh, device. It holds promise for applications to a lightweight, simplified, and highly mobile space activity suit that would be a complement to the MIT bio suit. Let MIT continue working on the suit. We'll do some work on the helmet. Uh, move the communications, data, and atmosphere uh, to the helmet. Only the helmet would be pneumatically pressurized. The body torso, again, would use the mechanical counterpressure technology, continue the preliminary design process, and conduct some criti critical technology tests, and then try to con uh, convince the CEO of DiveRight to fund a, a basic prototype program and initiate some underwater testing. And we think there's a very good chance that something along those lines will be done. As you saw on the schedule, we hope to have a preliminary meeting on that topic early October. Very exciting stuff for us, and uh, it seems to uh, have a lot of promise. Any questions? Yes, sir. Is there actually a, a mouthpiece inside the helmet? No. There would not be a mouthpiece inside the helmet. Does that make a lot of dead space for the exchange of gases? Well, what you don't see there is that we envision that the hoses would connect to the back, but on the inside there would be like plenums that would come around and eject and pick up the gas 
in the vicinity of the astronaut's frontal part of their face, but we haven't designed that yet. And we're thinking that there may be the one-way valves uh, to augment that demand capability. So there, by the way, there are some diving helmets that kind of have some of these features in them already. Yes, sir. Right. Mars, which is incredible. No water. Right. 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 And you still have to pull the water out because it's recovering so much water. Yes, sir. And so you have a dehumidifier in there. But yes. If the other is placed on the other side of it, you maybe have a guaranteed quiet environment for that. But my real question about that is how much more efficient or, or longer labor is going to be able to go with uh, lithium hydroxide than calcium? Significant. Significant, and that's what we're looking at actually. So one change, and by the way, Micropore manufactures a lithium hydroxide canister. Same technology, just a different absorbent. So we're probably going to do that. That would help us get our 12-hour duration that we're looking for for sure. Smaller package. Yes, sir. Lighter weight. And smaller weight. We think so, maybe because, yes. <laughs> calcium, calcium is very heavy. That's right. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a little confused on who's who. Um, who are you, your organization? Are you the company that currently makes the backpacks, or you're another company that wants to cooperate with that company? Who's who? Good question. <laughs> in that, in um, brevity, a lot of those details were left out. Actually, I'm a professor at Athens State University. Uh, PhD in engineering, uh, masters in space systems, and uh, I'm really just doing this for fun. <laughs> and I have a lot of graduate students and uh, undergraduate students that are working on this as, as class projects and so forth. Dive Right is the name of the company in Lake City, Florida that manufactures the rebreather. We have a rep of Dive Right in the back here, Dory Phillips, she's a certified rebreather diver, she brought the equipment. So I really have no uh, monetary investment in it really, but it's a kind of a passion that I have of trying to uh, adapt this technology for use on Mars. So if, and you might need to more, more than like to know more detail, I'll be glad to provide it. But I'm just an interested uh, agent, so to speak here, no, no uh, official capacity there. You. You're welcome. Thank you very much. My pleasure being here. Thank you.